Hi everyone and welcome to the Big Data Deep Dive with The Cube on EMC TV. I'm Richard Schlesinger and I'm here with tech industry entrepreneur and Wikibon analyst Dave Vellante and SiliconANGLE CEO and Editor-in-Chief John Furrier. Uh, for this last segment in our show, we're talking about the future of big data and there aren't two better guys to talk about that than you and I'm glad that you guys are here. Um, let me sort of tee up um, the, uh, this conversation a little bit with a video that we did because the, the, the results of big data leveraging are only as good as the data itself. There has to be the trust that the data is true and accurate and as unbiased as possible. So EMC TV addressed that issue and uh, we're just trying to sort of keep the, the dialogue going with, with this spot. We live in a world that is in a constant state of transformation. Political, natural. Transformation that has many faces, many consequences. A world overflowing with information with the potential to improve the lives of millions, the prospects of nations. With generations in the balance, we are awakening to the power of big data. We trust and together transform our future. So, gentlemen, trust. Um, without that, uh, where are we and how big of an issue is that in the, in the world of big data? Well, you know, the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, in the old days, the single version of the truth was what you were after with data warehousing. And people say that we're further away from a single version of the truth now with all this data. But the reality is, with big data and these new algorithms, you can algorithmically weed out the false positives, get rid of the bad data, and mathematically get to the good data a lot faster than you could before without a lot of processes around it. The machines can do it for you. So John, while we were watching that video, you murmured something about how this is the biggest issue, this is cutting edge stuff, this yeah. is what's important. I mean, trust uh, trust issues and trust the trust equation right now is, is, is still unknown. It's evolving fast. You see it with social networks, you see things go viral on the internet. Internet. And, and we live in a system now with mobility and cloud. Things are scaling infinitely you know, these days. And so good data scales big and bad data scales big. So whether it's a rumor on the, you hear and this gets viral or uh, the data, data trust is the most important issue. And sometimes big data can be creepy. So a, this is a really, really important area. People are watching it um, and trust is the most important thing. But you, know, you have to earn trust and we're still sort of at the beginning of this thing. So what has to happen to make sure that you know, you don't get the garbage in, so you get the garbage it, out. It's iterative, and, and we're seeing a lot of pilot projects, and then those pilot projects get reworked, and then they spawn into new projects, and so it's an evolution. And as I've said many, many times, it's very early. We've talked about we're just barely scratching the surface here. It's evolving, too, and the nature of the data is, is needs to be questioned as well. So what kind of data? Uh, for instance, if you don't authorize your data to be viewed, um, there's all kinds of technical issues around. Well, that's one side of it, but the other side of it, I mean, they're bad people out there who, who would try to influence uh, you know what, whatever conclusions were being drawn by big data programs especially when you think about big data sources so companies start with their internal data and they know that pretty well they know where the warts are they know how to manipulate it it's when they start bringing in outside data that this gets a lot fuzzier yeah it's a problem and security um, too. I talked to a guy uh, uh, not long ago who, who thought that big data could be used to protect big data that you could use big data techniques to detect um, anomalies in, 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 in data that's coming into the system, which you know is, yeah. is poetic, if nothing else. Well, so the bad guys totally, have big data. No, but that's, totally, that's, that's, oh, yeah. totally, that's totally happening, it's a by good, the way. It's a no, good it solution. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to move on because we, we, we really want to talk about how this stuff is going to be used, assuming that these trust issues can be solved. Um, and you know, the best minds in the world are, uh, are working on this issue to try to figure out how to best you know, leverage the data we all produce, which has been measured at uh, five exabytes every two days. And you know, somebody made an, uh, an analogy with like something if a byte was a paper clip and you stretched five exabytes worth of paper clips, they would go to the moon or whatever. Anyway, to it's a sun, lot of bytes. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. Actually, I think it's, it's a lot of paper sun clips. and back uh, well, many, many times. Many, like many hundred times. thousand times. Probably. I don't know. I've, I, 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 I've lost track of my paper clips. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, the, the best minds are trying to figure out, you know, how to, you know, maximize that, that, the value of that data. And they're, they're doing that not far from here where we, where we sit uh, at MIT at a place called CSAIL, which was just recently set up. 
Uh, CSAIL stands for the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. So we went there not long ago. It's just, you know, down the Mass Pike. It was an easy trip. And uh, this is what we found. It's fascinating. <laughs> Everybody is obviously talking about big data all the time and you hear it gets used to mean all different types of things. So one of the things we're trying to do in the big data at CSAIL program is to understand what are the different types of big data that exist in the world and how do we uh, help people to understand what different problems sort of fall under the, the overall umbrella of big data. CSAIL is the largest interdepartmental laboratory at MIT, so there's about 100 principal investigators, so that's faculty and uh, sort of senior research scientists, um, about 900 students who are involved. Basically, with big data, almost anything you do with it has to be on a much larger scale than we're used to. And the way it changes that equation is you have to, you have, to have the hardware and the software to do the things you're used to doing. You have to make them accommodate a larger size, a much larger size. A lot of times when people talk about big data, they mean not so much the volume of the data, but that the data, for example, is too complex for their existing data processing system to be able to deal with it. So it's, I've got information from a social network, from Twitter, I've got you know, information from a person's mobile phone maybe, I've got information about retail records, transactions, a whole very diverse set of things that need to be combined together. What this query says is this says, if you added this predicate to your query, mm -hmm. it would remove the dots that you selected. But that's part of what we're trying to do here in big data at CSAIL and our big data effort in general at MIT is to build a set of software tools that allow people to take all these different data sets, combine them together, um, ask questions and run algorithms on top of them that allow them to extract insight. I'm working with a, a data set that was derived by NASA, but the, the purpose of my work right now is to, to take data sets within databases and instead of querying them for table results, you query them and you get visualizations. So instead of looking at large sets of numbers and text and whatnot, you get a picture. And the, the motivation behind that is that humans are really good at interpreting pictures, they're not so good at interpreting huge tables. And with big data, that's a really big issue. <laughs> so this will allow scientists to visualize their data sets more quickly. So they can start exploring and, and um, I guess looking at it faster because with big data it's, it's a challenge to be able to visualize and explore your data. Um, I'm here just to proclaim what you already know, which is that the hour of big data has arrived in Massachusetts and it's a very, very exciting time. So Governor Patrick was here just a few weeks ago to announce the Mass Big Data Initiative and really I think what he recognizes and is partly what we recognize here is that there's an expertise in the state of Massachusetts in areas that are related to big data, partly because of companies like EMC as well as a number of other companies in the sort of database analytics space. EMC is a partner in our Big Data at CCL initiative and Big Data at CCL is an industry focused initiative that brings companies uh, together to work with MIT to think about big data problems, help to understand what big data means for the companies, and also to allow the companies to give feedback to us about what are the most important problems for them to be working on and potentially expose our students and give access to uh, these companies to our students. So, I think the future will tell us, and it's hard to say right now, because we haven't done a lot of, I think, analyzing and interpreting of big data. We haven't reached our potential yet and I just there are just so many things that we can't see right now. So one of the things that people tell us uh, that are involved in big data is they have trouble finding the skill sets, the data science cap capability and capacity. And so seeing videos like this one at MIT, there's a new breed 
of students coming out, they're, they're growing up in this big data world, and that's critical to keep the big data pipeline flowing. And John, you and I have spent a lot of time in the East Coast looking at some of the big data companies. It's almost a renaissance for Massachusetts and Cambridge, and uh, it's very exciting to see. Obviously, there's a lot going on on the West Coast as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm impressed with MIT and around MIT and Cambridge is exploding with young, young new guns coming out of there, the new rock stars, if you will. But in California, where we're headquartered in Palo Alto, you know, we had a chance that we go up close to Google, Facebook, and Jeff Hammerbacker, who will show a video in a second uh, that I interviewed with him at uh, Hadoop Summit. He was the first uh, guy at, data, at Facebook to build a data platform, which now has completely changed Facebook and made it what it is. He's also the co-founder of Cloudera, the leader in Hadoop, which we've talked about. And he's the poster child, in my opinion, of a data scientist. He's a math geek, but he understands the world problems. It's not just a tech thing. It's a bigger picture. That, I think that's key. I mean, he knows he knows that you have to apply this stuff. So, you and, know. And, and the passion that he has, this video from Jeff Hammerbacher, co-founder of Cloudera, watch this video, but, and, and the thing you walk away is that big data is for everyone, and, and it's about having the passion. Hammerbacher, data scientist from Cloudera, co-founder, uh, Hacking Data, Twitter handle. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So, you're known in the industry, obviously everyone knows you on Twitter, you're on Quora, heavily um, follow you there. Um, at Facebook, you built the data platform for Facebook, one of the guys, main guys there, hacking the data over at Facebook. Look what happened, right? I mean, the yeah. data tsunami that Facebook has is amazing. Co-founder of Cloudera. You saw the vision, Amar Awadala always quotes on theCUBE, we've seen the future, no one knows it yet. That was a year and a half ago, now everyone knows it. So yeah, how yeah. do you feel about that as the co-founder, Cloudera, $40 million in funding, validation, again, more validation. How do you feel? <laughs> yeah, I know, sure, it's exciting. I think, uh, you know, as data volumes have grown and as the complexity of data uh, that is collect and collected and analyzed has increased, you know, novel software architectures have emerged. And I think what I'm most excited about is the fact that uh, that software is open source and we're playing a key role in driving where that software is going. And I'm, you know, I think what I'm most excited about on top of that is the commodification of that software. You know, I'm tired of talking about the container in which you put your data. Uh, I think a lot of the creativity is happening uh, in the data collection, integration, and preparation stage. Uh, so I think, you know, there was a, a tremendous focus uh, over the past several decades on the modeling aspect of data. So we, we really uh, increased the sophistication of our understanding, uh, uh, you know, classification and regression and optimization and all, all of the uh, the hardcore modeling that gets done. Uh, and now we're seeing, okay, we've got these great tools to use at the end of the pipe. Uh, so now, how do we get more data pushed through uh, th those those modeling algorithms? So there's a lot of innovative work. So were you thinking at the time uh, how you uh, make money at this, or did you just say, well, let's just go solve the problem and good things will happen? It was it was a lot more of the latter. You know, I didn't leave Facebook to start a company. Uh, I just left Facebook because I was ready to do something new and I knew this was a huge movement and I felt that you know it was very Nash and, un and unfinished uh, as, as a software infrastructure so when the opportunity with Cloudera came along uh, I really jumped on it and I've been absolutely blown away by the commercial success we've had uh, so I didn't I certainly didn't set out with a master plan about how to extract um, value from this my master plan has always been uh, to really drive Hadoop into the background of enterprise infrastructure I really want it to be as obvious of a choice as Linux. And you see, like you're, you're, we've talked a lot at this conference and, uh, and others about um, you know, Hadoop moving from you know, the fringe to the mainstream commercial enterprises, and all those guys are looking at it. We heard J.P. Morgan Chase today, we're, we're building competitive advantage, we're saving money. Um, those guys do have a master plan to make money. Does that change the dynamic of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, or is that really exciting to you as an entrepreneur? Oh yeah, for sure it's exciting. I mean, what we're trying to do 
is facilitate their master plan, right? Like we want to we want to identify the commonalities in everyone's master plan and then commoditize it so that they can avoid the undifferentiated heavy lifting that Jeff Bezos points out. Uh, you know, you know, no one should be required to uh, to invest tremendous amounts of money in their container anymore, right? They they should really be identifying novel data sources, new algorithms to manipulate that data, the smartest people for using that data, and that's where they should be building their competitive advantage. Uh, and we really feel that you know we know where the market's going, and we're very confident in our product strategy. And I think over the next few years, uh, you know, you guys are going to be pretty uh, excited about the the stuff we're building because I know that I'm personally very excited. And yeah, we're very excited about the competition because number one, more people building open source software has never made me angry. <laughs> yeah. You know, so so you know that's kind of the marketplace. So you know we're talking about data science. Uh -huh. You're building a data science team. So first, tell us uh, before we drill into data science, talk about the, what you're doing at Cloudera around data science. Uh -huh. Your team and your goals and what is a data scientist I mean this is now you know is it the DBA for Hadoop or oh, no, no. you know what you know sure sure what, so what, what's, what's going on <laughs> yeah so you know to kind of reflect on the genesis of the term you know when we were building out the data team at Facebook we kind of had two classes of analysts we had uh, data analysts who were more traditional um, business intelligence you know building canned reports performing data retrieval queries doing you know lightweight analytics and then we had research scientists who were often PhDs and things like so sociology uh, or economics or psychology and they were doing much more of the deep dive longitudinal uh, complex modeling exercises and uh, I really wanted to combine those two things I didn't want to have those two folks be separate in the same way that we combined engineering and operations on our data infrastructure group so uh, I literally just took data analyst and research scientist and put them together and called it data scientist um, so so that's kind of the the origin of the title uh, and then how that's translated and what we do at Clyde era so I've recently hired two folks into a, uh, a burgeoning data science science group at Cloudera. So what, the way we see the market evolving is that, you know, the infrastructure is going to be commoditized. Yeah, so what's yeah. the mindset to really be a data scientist? I mean, you know, what is, uh, we should be thinking about, I mean, there's no real manual. I mean, most people are born with math skills, economics, yeah, these yeah. kinds of disciplines you mentioned. What should someone prepare themselves? How do they approach it? How does uh, someone say, hey, I want to hire a data scientist? How do I fill the rec yeah. form? Yeah, yeah. These kinds of things. Well, I tend to, you know, I played a lot of sports growing up, and there's this phrase, you know, of being a gym rat, um, which is someone who's always in the gym just practicing uh, whatever sport it is that they love. And I find that most uh, data scientists are sort of data rats. They're always, uh, they're always going out, grabbing a new data. So you're, there's a genuine curiosity about seeing what's happening in data that, that you really can't teach. But uh, in terms of the skills that, you, that are required, I didn't really find any one uh, background to be perfect. Uh, so I actually put together a course at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, and taught it uh, this spring. Uh, called Introduction to Data Science. And uh, I'm teaching it, again, uh, teaching it again this coming spring. And they're actually going to uh, put it into the core curriculum uh, in the fall of next year for computer science. All right, Jeff Hammerbacher, thanks so much for that insight. Great epic uh, talk here on theCUBE. Uh, another another epic conversation <laughs> shared with the world live. Uh, congratulations on the on the funding, another Thank 40 so million. It's great validation. You bet. And uh, congratulations for essentially being part of the data science and finding that whole movement, Facebook, and and uh, now with Amr Awadallah and the team at Cloudera, you've done a great job. So congratulations. And congratulations on the, all the competition. <laughs> <laughs> keeping you keeping oh, yeah, you moving yeah, faster. That's capitalism, right? All right. Keep it on our Okay. It's great, isn't it, that with all these great minds working in this industry, they still can't, we're so early in this that they still can't really define what a data scientist is. I mean, what is, <laughs> talk about an, an industry in its infancy. That's what's so exciting. Everyone has a different definition of what it is. And that, that what that means is, is that it's everyone. I think data science represents uh, the new everybody. It could be a housewife, it could be a homemaker to a, an eighth grader. It doesn't matter. If you see an insight and you see something that can be solved, data is out there and I think that's the future. And Jeff Hammerbach had talked about spending all this time in technology with undifferentiated heavy lifting and I'm excited that we are moving beyond that into you know, essentially the human part of, of big data and it's going to have a huge impact as we talked about before on the productivity of organizations and potentially productivity of lives. I mean, look at what we've talked about th this, this afternoon. I mean, we've talked about predicting volcanoes. We've talked about, uh, you know, uh, medical issues. We've talked about all, pretty much every aspect of life. And I guess that's really the message of this industry now, is that the folks who are managing big data are looking to change pretty much every aspect of life. This is the biggest 
inflection point in history of technology that I've ever seen in the sense that it truly affects everything. And the data that's generated and the data that machines generate, the data that humans generate, the data that forests generate, things like that, everything is generating data. So this is a time where we can actually instrument it. So this is why there's massive disruption in this area. And disruption, we should say to the uninitiated, is a good thing in this yeah. business. We well, creation, disruption. entrepreneurship, companies are being founded. It's a <laughs> great opportunity. Well, I appreciate your time. I, unfortunately, I think that's going to wrap it up for our big data deep dive. John and Dave, the Cube guys have been great. Um, I really appreciate you showing up here and you know, just lending your insights and expertise and all that. And I want to thank you, the audience, for joining us. So you should stay tuned for the ongoing conversation on the Cube and to EMC TV to be informed, inspired, and hopefully engaged. I'm Richard Schlesinger. Thank you very much for joining us.